Hey everybody, welcome back to One Seed, One World. I'm just hanging with my gnome here. Garden gnomes. I'm not actually a big fan of garden gnomes, but uh, Mitzi likes them, and so we have this one. This one's a little beat up and old, but you know, he still, still serves his purpose. But it got me thinking about, uh, maybe we could do a quick segment on the weird yet true history of garden gnomes. Did you know that garden gnomes were actually once real people? Now I'm not talking about like mythical creatures like the fairy folk or elves or you know a lot of these other types of uh, things that have come up in uh, mythology over the years. But these little ceramic figurines were actually based on something or some people that actually existed in a portion of history. So, back during the Georgian period, um, I should clarify that the Georgian period uh, is a part of British history that probably uh, ranged from about 1714 to 1830-ish. Uh, why is it called the Georgian period? It's because it's when, during that period, all the monarchs during that time were named George. There was King George the First, King George the Second, King George the Third, and King George the Fourth. Although in some accounts it also extends to include uh, William the Fourth, uh, that ruled from 1830 to 1837. So it just kind of depends on what you're looking at. But during that period, wealthy landowners often had very large, elaborate gardens. Not so much like the vegetable gardens like we do here on this channel, but more, you know, like flowers and shrubs and trees and fountains and ponds and all that kind of thing. And it was a way that they could uh, kind of show off their wealth. But along with, you know, this wealthy mindset and showing off their possessions and their beautiful gardens, there was also certain philosophies of life that they were very into, I guess you would say. One of these things was melancholy. And uh, showing off melancholy was also attributed to being, you know, very intelligent as well. And so they would try to have things that would represent melancholy. One of these things was having a hermit live in their garden an actual live person that would live in their garden. And these hermits were to be considered wizened, scruffy, kind of old wizard looking people that they would hire to then just live on their property for a certain amount of time and just kind of exist there. Hermits weren't allowed to, in most cases, were not allowed to talk to anyone uh, to mingle with guests. They were just used for ornamental purposes. And in a lot of cases, they weren't allowed to even have a whole lot of good personal hygiene. Part of the requirements to be a hermit on one of these wealthy landowners uh, gardens was not to cut your fingernails. In a lot of cases, not to bathe, not to cut your hair, to have a long beard. Then the wealthy landowner would provide a place uh, for this hermit to live. You know, it might be a small chalet, cabin, shack, some cases a cave. Um, and then when they had their guests come for parties and whatnot, the guests would admire their gardens and look at everything. And then also they would admire this hermit living there uh, that would represent the melancholy that they were attuned with and, and you know, having that intelligence factor. Here is uh, an ad that was actually placed by one wealthy landowner by the name of Charles Hamilton. And this is where the ad read. He shall be provided with a Bible, optical glasses, a mat for his feet, a hassock for his pillow, an hourglass for timepiece, water for his beverage, and food from the house. He must wear a camlet robe, and never, under any circumstances, must he cut his hair, beard, or nails, stray beyond the limits of Mr. Hamilton's grounds, or exchange one word with the servant. 
So, you know, they had very specific requirements for this job. And in a lot of cases, um, living that way, because these job contracts were on average for seven years, they'd hire someone to come like live in this little hamlet thing in their garden uh, and not be able to really bathe or wash or cut their hair or anything. And uh, there was, you know, plenty of times where the hermit hired after a few months or maybe a couple years would be like, I've had enough of this and they're out of there. The problem was is that if you gave up before your contract was up, a lot of times you, they wouldn't get paid. Uh, so, you know, they had that going for them. But it was just another way to show off the wealth. And uh, that's where the, the, these little ceramic garden gnomes that we're so familiar with now in so many people's yards and gardens, that's where they originated from. Now, as that period ended and, and that kind of wealth was not so much, um, you know, looked at favorably, uh, and also melancholy was not quite all the rage anymore, then the hiring of the garden gnome kind of faded into history uh, as, you know, we people in general stopped treating other people as ornaments uh, or hiring them as ornaments. And, um, you know, it kind of went away. Although some people try to bring it back. Actually, uh, as recently as 2014, there was an ad on Craigslist uh, by a woman that was looking to hire a hermit. And her ad read very similar to that of Charles Hamilton. Uh, it was more actually extensive, but it was similar. I wonder if she ever found anybody to fill the position. So that is the history of the garden gnome. It's a little weird, uh, but very true. You know, it's, it's part of uh, British history. So, you know, if you're hanging with your gnomies uh, in your neck of the woods, then uh, I hope you found that little bit of information interesting. And I hope that you are having a great day. Uh, so whatever's going on in your gnomesteads, uh, gardens or whatever it is that you have, I hope it's working out great for you. And uh, thanks for hanging out with me again today. We'll see you again soon. Namaste.